Today I'm going to tell you about some uh, pretty well-known Agile tools that you probably heard uh, about before. Uh, and I will not uh, teach the details of those tools to you, but I will tell you how we use them uh, at my company, at the company that I worked with, uh, and uh, what the, the general results were and what we learned from that experience. Uh, so the first question I have for you, who has heard of Tom Gilb? Please stand up. Tom Gilb. Exactly because after lunch. <laughs> okay, st uh, keep standing, keep standing. Uh, now, who has heard of impact mapping? Please join them. Impact mapping. Great. Okay. Uh, and who has heard of iterative and incremental development? <laughs> okay. Who, who, uh, and now who is not sleeping? Okay, I, we have some uh, phone users here uh, that are sleeping. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. That, uh, that confirms my suspicion that you all know the tools I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to tell you about our experiences. Okay, so let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Michał, uh, and I'm a product owner at For Finance. For Finance is a, a big financial corporation that uh, uh, the head headquarters is in Riga, in Latvia, and uh, uh, we have branches in 12 countries. So it's a pretty big scope and, uh, and a complex kind of a corporate structure that you can, it's not just one team that you need to talk to, there's like many different interests uh, involved. Um, and actually, the systems that we are creating, uh, actually that my team is, uh, is creating right now, we, we already we've uh, deployed the kind of a first version uh, about a month ago, and already about 1.5 million euro flowed through our payment systems uh, that we are developing. Uh, so both the, the, the organizational scope and the uh, kind of user impact is, uh, is pretty significant. Uh, and I will tell you how, how all those tools worked in, uh, in, in our situation. So first of all, uh, I, I want you to, to think about uh, the tools that we are going to talk about. They are thinking tools, that means that uh, they help you uh, Create uh, like f for your own creativity to for your uh, to structure your own thinking and your own ideas, and also they are useful for communication between different people. The, they have a kind of a high density of information uh, in a relatively uh, sh uh, small amount of uh, of content, let's say. Uh, but it is very important to think of them like as tools that help you communicate and tools that help you think. And they are not tools to program your organization. They do not guarantee anything by themselves. They only help you communicate. And of course, it is important uh, to communicate with people effectively, but it is not enough to get things done. Uh, so just keep that in mind that uh, those are just supporting tools. Okay, so the, the three tools that uh, uh, we are going to talk about, as you might have guessed, uh, it is impact mapping, then a little bit about the general idea of iterative and incremental development, which is uh, kind of obvious for all us agile people, but uh, I think it is uh, uh, not, uh, in practice, it is uh, not often uh, correctly applied, I would say. Uh, and the third thing is uh, the idea of quantification from, of, of customer values, uh, uh, of uh, the qualities of your software uh, taken from Tom Group. Okay, so uh, the first part is about uh, impact mapping. Uh, and by the way, I have to warn you, uh, I don't only have positive examples. Uh, I will also share some uh, horrible failures uh, that we have experienced uh, uh, with those tools. Uh, okay, so the first thing is uh, impact mapping. Uh, so a short uh, reminder for, for people. Uh, impact mapping is a, is a way to think about uh, planning and prioritization and brainstorming that assumes that first you have to define uh, at, at the center of the map you have a goal and it's good that it is a kind of a quantified goal very precisely stated what you want to achieve. But, and then you don't uh, just jump into solutions. Uh, first, you think about who can impact this goal. So for example, if you want to increase sales, we can think of course the, the, wh whose behavior has to change for us to achieve our goal. Any ideas? We want to increase sales. Whose behavior has to change? Definitely, the customers have to buy more. But somebody said salespeople, 
that is also a different group of people. So, of course, the behavior of salespeople, if we have a direct sales force, uh, also impacts uh, our goal. Uh, and we can say that, okay, so, so we can, uh, and, and we can, uh, when, when you think like that, it, it is uh, easier to not forget about some important group of people that can actually either help us or hinder uh, the achievement of our goal. For example, we can have some uh, cool ideas about what to do with customer data, uh, but then maybe the security department, uh, uh, their, their behavior would have to change uh, because the, some policies prevent us from using the, the data in, in some way. Uh, so, so first think about who can impact your, uh, your goal, and then uh, uh, what, um, what, so, uh, who, what kind of behavior has to change. So this is the impact, the change in behavior, and only then think about the features uh, that, um, uh, that you, or, or the things that you can do to, to influence the change in behavior that you want. Uh, okay, so this is the general framework, and actually at our company we did the big uh, um, impact mapping workshop at the headquarters uh, with product owners from all the countries. Uh, and because we have 12, 12 business offices, but we have uh, IT offices, development, software development in four countries. Uh, so uh, we, we came, all came to Riga and we did the impact mapping workshop. Uh, we did it a, a little bit differently. Uh, first we collected the ideas and then we tried to like reverse engineer uh, those uh, impacts and who they impact and uh, does this actually lead to the goal that we want. Uh, and then we uh, evaluated all of those ideas that we had uh, and uh, um, uh, that were already requested by different uh, customers within the organization and then we prioritized them. Okay, so which impacts actually serve what we want and uh, out of all the impacts that we hope to achieve, which are more important than not. And we made a list. There were about 12 uh, kind of uh, uh, directions. Uh, uh, so, for example, acquisition, um, marketing, and uh, I don't want to go into details, but like a list of, let's say, 12 metrics, 12 areas that we want to impact. But we prioritized and then we selected the top four that we want to really focus on. Uh, and of course, uh, what do you think happened? Uh, of course, you can imagine that we went back to our countries and basically continued on our project, maybe a little bit uh, more uh, aware of uh, the context. But basically, uh, no big things changed, which really could be a sign that we, already, we were already doing important stuff uh, before this project. Uh, so at first I thought that, uh, okay, some kind of corporate bullshit again uh, uh, doesn't impact anything. But then a funny story happened. Uh, uh, the company hired a really high-level uh, director uh, and he came in and uh, a week after he joined, uh, uh, he sent an email to all the IT guys uh, and girls. Um, and uh, he said, oh, uh, I just joined you, so uh, welcome. And I have so many cool ideas. Uh, I will show you how to save uh, so many thousands of euros uh, uh, on uh, his area. Uh, so, uh, and, and basically in, in the context, so please drop your stuff and let's start working on my ideas. Uh, and uh, actually, we, so, so now uh, it turned out that uh, he got a quick reply that, oh, oh yeah, uh, we agree, those ideas are very cool. But we had this workshop recently and actually the priorities of the company are a little bit different. So uh, he, his improvements were in debt collection, uh, but actually debt, our debt collection is uh, good enough. We want to focus on other things. So like his projects were, uh, even though he had like a lot of, uh, uh, he, he was like attached at a very high level, uh, he, uh, we managed to avoid uh, this disruption and uh, maximize the amount of work not done. So he wanted to put some more work on our plate, but we managed to use this tool uh, to avoid that uh, and uh, keep focusing on the important stuff that we agreed that is actually strategically important for the whole company. Okay, so this is one story um, how we used it. it. It was pretty valuable. So, so the first part, just the prioritization, it did, didn't change much, but it was like a confirmation that yes, what we are working on is important and it is important because A, B, and C. So now we know that uh, when we can change direction, we know in which the, uh, how, to, how to test if we didn't go too far away from the value stream, let's say. Uh, and, uh, and, but definitely it, it is useful to completely cut out less valuable projects. And I think it's a, it's a pretty valuable uh, use case for, for this method. Okay. Okay, so that was the uh, first story. 
the second story I want to talk a little bit about iterative and incremental development. Uh, so, of course, iterative means that we do it in short cycles uh, and hopefully learn in between. Uh, and incremental means that we deliver, uh, th that the stuff that we build in the earlier cycles is like completely usable. We can deliver it, use it, test it, whatever. Um, so uh, th I would say that uh, there are two parts to this uh, principle. Uh, one part is that uh, if we transition from a kind of, a, let's say, waterfall kind of thinking, uh, the big bad wolf of, uh, of software development, uh, we, um, the, the, the thing that we do is we, we look at this whole big project that we have and we try to cut out the, the heart from this project and uh, focus just uh, to deliver this uh, key piece, this little uh, thing, that, uh, so that uh, people can start to use it, of course, and that we can ver verify that it is actually useful uh, and the whole project makes sense. And by experiencing this little part, we can also much better uh, adjust the, uh, the other stories that we deliver later to m match the actual needs and not just the expectations from the beginning of the project. Uh, and I would say this is the, the easy part. Uh, that uh, most people uh, are aware that this, this is a good idea and most people do it and it is in most cases relatively easy to achieve. Uh, of course, the, the, the in big corporations especially there can be some obstacles even to that but it is relatively easy. Uh, and uh, that is actually a, um, a good thing because it is uh, from those two aspects I think this is the, the more valuable because it helps us avoid as with the previous example, it can help us avoid useless work. So we deliver some small part, uh, a vote of non-confidence a little bit, I think, but hopefully the rest of it. Um, so uh, it helps us, like we, when we deliver the skateboard, for example, we can avoid going to the car because the skateboard is enough or it turns out that they need something completely different or whatever. Uh, and uh, of course, we are also using it in, in this way. Um, uh, to, so, for, um, yeah. so, for example, in, in my current project, we are de delivering uh, credit cards for Spain, uh, credit card support for Spain, uh, and next uh, also for Denmark. Uh, but we, in, in both of those projects, we have basically this, these kinds of stories. Okay, so the customer can pay with a crowd card. This is relatively easy, but then it gets more complicated. You, can, uh, you should be able to store a card, and when you store a card, you have to take care of security. It is not so easy. Um, and then, of course, when you store a card, of course, you store it to reuse it. And then, uh, when you have a stored card, you can also play with uh, some automatic payments. Uh, so, the, the, uh, of course, the, the thing is that uh, I don't know why, in, in what world, we would have to wait to deliver all of the scope before we can put it in production. Of course, first we deliver the first line, and it has already been working for about a month, and as I mentioned, more than a million euros flowed through it, even without those advanced features. Um, Okay, so this is the easy part, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the, there's also a second part to iterative and incremental development, and that means that uh, as in uh, some road trips, uh, is, are, are, are we there yet? Are we there yet? So getting, to, getting there, getting to done at the end of every iteration is a little bit harder. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are many different obstacles to getting there. One is a temptation to start new work before the old work is finished, for a variety of reasons. Because uh, uh, closing some feature is hard, because there are some obstacles, maybe some blockers. And if we label those blockers as external blockers, and uh, then we can focus on the new cool development stuff instead of uh, dealing with, let's say, deployment problems. Um, this is uh, one reason, or just uh, um, uh, another reason could be the uh, pressure from uh, customers that, oh, please do this uh, urgent thing for us uh, because it cannot wait for some reason. Um, and also there are, of course, technical problems that uh, if you de de develop some feature, but uh, uh, there are still a lot of bugs and you don't have, a, uh, let's say, a stable testing infrastructure or whatever. Fortunately, we have uh, that, but it's not always there. Um, and uh, th this is, uh, so in my experience and uh, as, a, uh, as a product owner, and previously I was also an agile trainer and coach, I saw many teams, and uh, I, I didn't see very many teams that could actually do it. There were always parachuters uh, jumping from, uh, from one sprint to the next. Um, 
and it is, it, it, I found that this is a, actually very hard to, to, to get it uh, to done. Uh, and um, I, would, I would say that uh, uh, the getting the second part right, the first one is valuable. We can avoid a lot of work, we can still improve efficiency in terms of delivering actually valuable stuff uh, by a lot. Uh, but the second thing is the second part actually closing everything in every iteration, not beginning new stuff before finishing old ones and doing it regularly. Uh, this is actually a pr prerequisite to a really high performance. Like if you want to, uh, the first thing is that, okay, you have the, the performance that you have, it is probably good enough, and uh, cutting the useless stuff is, uh, is a multiplier of your effectiveness, but if you really want to improve, then the second part is what you, you need to focus on more. Okay. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, so this is the part that we are also struggling with, with a bit. Fortunately, like the, fir the first part is enough, uh, but, but this is what we want to attack next. Okay, how much time do we have? Okay. Um, so the, the third story I want to tell you is about uh, uh, quantification. Uh, so some of you know Tom Gilbert, around half of you, I think. Uh, so uh, Tom Gilbert is uh, all about uh, quantifying things. Uh, he said that uh, it's like uh, you, could, you could say that he invented Agile many years before Agile uh, became known, and the creators of Agile, uh, especially like, uh, for example Jeff Sutherland, they explicitly uh, agree that yes, we have learned a lot from Tom Gilb, and he has the book, the published books, uh, uh, to prove it, and the projects uh, that he uh, organized or helped organize uh, uh, to prove it, like 20 or 30 years before. Uh, before Agile uh, was, uh, the name Agile was created. Uh, and he, the, the, the main difference uh, from my limited knowledge of it, because he, he really created a lot, a lot of knowledge, but from my understanding, like, the, the key thing that is missing from, uh, in, in our uh, typical approach to Agile, is that uh, we not only want to focus on working software, but also on the value, on the results uh, that we want to achieve, and also uh, on quantifying the uh, the qualities of our product, so not just the functionality, what the system does, but how well it does it. Uh, and his, his thing is like you, have, you can quantify everything. So uh, a typical example that he gave at a, a nice talk for, at TEDx, you can find it online, uh, is that, okay, uh, you say that uh, you can quantify everything, but what about love? Uh, it's, uh, you, some people would say that, oh, it's impossible to quantify love. But uh, as usual, when you have trouble with quantifying something, it's uh, easier to first decompose it and then try to quantify it. So this is a uh, decomposition, uh, uh, possible decomposition of love. So uh, when you are in love, what does this mean to you? Okay, so this is trust, respect, friendship, sharing, and so on. Uh, and uh, the, the lower example is what do you mean by trust? Okay, love, subcomponent trust, Within, within trust, it is truthfulness. Yeah. Uh, most of you would agree probably that truthful, truthfulness is uh, required for, uh, for love. Uh, and uh, you would say that ambition, no lies. Scale, average black lies per month. Um, uh, past, uh, 42 um, black lies per year. Okay, so this is maybe not so good, so the, uh, and uh, ex-spouse, so this uh, relationship failed. We have a new relationship, okay, our goal is to have a higher level of love, uh, so maybe let's uh, cut the lies by lying by half. Maybe this will be enough. Okay, so uh, this is the point, and uh, you could say that, yeah, you could do it, but uh, why? Why do it in this way? It kinda, uh, for, for some people, it could be very strange. Or why quantify love? Um, it's, uh, uh, why is it useful? Uh, and I would say that it is useful because it helps us avoid misunderstanding. So as I said in the beginning, it is not a way to program your organization or anyone, but it is a way to communicate very precisely what you mean. And uh, I would say that when you are talking about something important, it would be usually useful to at least try to express it as a number. And when you do, later you can forget this number and uh, you can just be, you, you don't have to like marry yourself to, to your representation that you choose. But when you talk about something and you find that you cannot express, you, you don't know how to express it as a number, then uh, there's a high probability that you don't know what you're talking about. And even if you do, there's a high probability that anyone that, is, that you talk to will not understand. And even if he does understand, there is a high likelihood that he will understand it differently. 
so it, it, uh, of course it doesn't guarantee anything, but it's like a useful track, useful tool to actually find out what you're talking about. Hmm. So uh, the example is, what about our projects? What are the risks? What, if we have misunderstanding, so what? Maybe we'll just have some misunderstanding. Uh, but actually, this has some real cost associated to it. When we misunderstand the requirements for a large project, we can lose a lot of money, uh, or at least an opportunity to make some money. Uh, so this is uh, one, uh, st stati some statistics uh, done by Gilb that uh, th they usually take the requirements for some big project um, and they count the defects in the requirements. So statements that are so vague as to be meaningless, uh, of course, cannot be the basis of a serious engineering effort. Uh, and, and, uh, and they measure it and then they uh, run their training and they uh, institute some uh, inspection processes and you can see the reduction in... Um, uh, in the misunderstanding, the defects uh, in your requirements. And uh, in our projects, uh, you could say that we probably write less documentation, but you can also apply it to conversations. Even if you talk frequently, it is also good to, uh, and, and we have like a sh even uh, a shorter uh, opportunity for mistakes because we will, for example, at the next sprint review, we will find out that we have understood something wrong. So the risk is less than previously, let's say, but uh, still, uh, let's say two weeks uh, of a whole team, it's not, not something uh, that uh, we can ignore. Um, Okay, so this is uh, 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 not, not, not a direct representation, but this is also a visualization that you can, you can track uh, your investment in an effort and the results. So in our projects, this is, we, we are also using it, but we are using it in this way that I said. We are using it to improve communication. We are not tracking it precisely. We are not contracting results. We are not promising, guaranteeing specific levels. Um, but uh, we are tracking how much time we spend on stuff and uh, we are tracking like what the uh, quality attributes are of our system. That means, okay, we changed uh, something, like we added this credit card process. How many clicks did we save for customers? So a typical payment, it used to take like 12 clicks because you had to go to your internet bank, whatever. Uh, and now it takes one click when you save uh, the card and you can reuse it, for example. So we track how well our payment systems work for customers. And the second order effects, okay, uh, does this actually have impact? Are we selling more? Are people extending uh, their loans more and repaying them and we have less debt and stuff like that? Uh, so this is the, the third example that I wanted to share. So it's a, it's a very simple concept, but it's uh, kind of uncomfortable when you're not used to it. Uh, and you definitely can go too far when you try to lock down uh, uh, your understanding of the situation. But it is uh, uh, very, very useful to sometimes choose. Okay, now we will uh, like put a pin uh, in our board, and this is exactly what we're talking about right now. And then we can later we can we can change it, of course. But uh, it is useful to at least it was useful for us. Okay, so those are the three stories I had for you. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can go to my blog, and there are some articles about that, and I will also add some more after the conference. Thank you.